from your vantage point, from your the way your brain works, can you explain to me how we might perceive the world differently? I imagine you're processing information all the time in a way that like, your brain must be really noisy. Well, you learn to filter it out <clears throat> after a while. You become a kind of a monomaniac. You notice all these guys running around with Asperger's syndrome that don't seem to be paying too much attention are very involved in what's going on around them. That's because they have a richer mental life. What's going on in their heads is much more complex than most people understand. So like at this moment, what's going through your mind? What else, are you, what are you perceiving in this room, in your mind? Can you try and describe it to me? To... You know, I'm perceiving a situation in which I want to avoid putting both feet in my mouth and swallowing, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, like anybody else. Yeah. But yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I find this whole thing very, very interesting. There's a lot of technology here. And I wonder how some of it works because I'm not entirely sure how all of it works. For example, those cameras over there, as far as the, the what, what I'm taking in, what I'm drinking in right now, is just visual pictures like anybody else, and those are being filed away. And later on, I will edit those, throw out the ones that I don't want, and keep the ones that I do. And I'll have some very clear pictures of this entire thing when I get done, but there will be a lot of stuff that's thrown out, too. And you have to become good at, at, at figuring out what to keep and what to throw out. That's part of being intelligent. A lot of people have what I call trash can memories. They remember everything that happens, right? Other people do a lot of editing and they don't remember so much. They only remember the important key things. The ability to remember those key things is what distinguishes a really intelligent person from one who's not. Are you, are you able to read people quickly? Yes, I have very good human instincts. That comes from having been a bar bouncer for 25 years. So uh, what if you... Now we've known each other for 20 minutes, but like if you had a, to give me a quick read, what would, how would you, what would you read me as in the 20 minutes you've got to? Uh, I would think that you were a, an intelligent, somewhat bookish person who probably wouldn't hurt a fly, even if the fly attacked him, and uh, that you'd, you're also a very amiable and easy to get along with person. You'd get into any bar I ever worked. So I thought emotional intelligence would require some self-awareness also, some, some, some intelligence about your own emotional... Uh... Well, that's called, called metacognition. Basically, it's a kind of a transcendental ability where you rise above yourself and look down on yourself from above. It's a different level of thought where you've got the level, the object level, where you're, you're talking about things that you see, and then you talk about the level where you talk about yourself talking about things that you see. And then you can go up from there. And metacognition, if it's mobile, it can actually go up a, an arbitrary degree until finally you experience oneness with the universe. So is, is, it, is, is it a spiritual, is it connected to spirituality? Yes, ultimately it does, and ultimately it is, because you connect with the identity of reality itself, if you can do it well enough. Which brings us to your, you should probably explain it, but the... Uh... CTMU, Cognitive Theoretic Model of the universe. And is, that's the project you're working on? Yes, it's the attempt to understand ultimate reality. Are you trying to discover something or prove something? How would you define it? Is it? Well, you're trying to do both. When you're trying to understand reality, you want to be able to use that understanding for other purposes if you have them. But also there's a certain amount of, of, of insight and pleasure to be gotten from just understanding what, ident what, what reality is. And that's what the CTMU does for me and it could potentially do for others as well. And what's your theory of what reality is? If you take a look at reality, the highest level of reality, the very highest level is going to be an identity. An identity is something that distributes over everything in the system, right? And the CTMU is designed to be that identity. So it is everywhere present on both physical and metaphysical levels. But the one thing you talked about is that I remember when I was researching you was your idea was that if you can hold this entire universe in your mind's eye simultaneously and all of its complexities that you can, then you'll be able to understand God. Isn't that what God does? Yeah. Okay, he holds everything in his mind or his meta mind simultaneously. So in order, in order to really understand what reality is and what God is, you have to be able to kind of do that yourself. Of course, we're just human beings, so the only way we can do that is to wrap everything up in a very small package. That's what the CTMU is. So what is God in this, in your mind? Or in your, in, yeah, what is God? Well, you know, God has been called a number of things, but one of the things he's been called, especially in, in, in Christian theology, which is our dominant theology, he's been called Logos which is the word, which of course, word means a piece of language. 
looking at a piece of language. And that is exactly what the CTMU is. It models reality as a language. What's your definition of God, personally? The identity of reality. You see, I've been talking about reality, and I've been talking about the identity of reality. God is reality. As a matter of fact, God is the ultimate reality. He is reality on its very highest level. No other definition of God makes sense. So the idea is that the universe and all of us and our mind and our perception all adds up to be God? Right, the universe is a coupling of mind and perceptual reality. Right? What you see out there, the external world and the internal world, the internal world being your mind. This is a coupling, and it's not a coupling you can take apart and reduce to separate parts. It is one thing with two aspects. That's what I mean by a coupling, and that's what the universe is, and that's what God is as well. Except God has the power to actually factorize himself or fractionate himself into this coupling. And um, do you consider yourself, yourself spiritual? I think you have to be to do what I do, yeah. In what way? Like, how do you define your spirituality? Well, I would def uh, I'm aware of the metaphysical structure of reality. If you take the average person, you know, they really think that they live in the material world and that uh, that's it. All right, anybody who is aware that there is actually another dimension or other dimensions to reality, then you start getting into spirituality. Because what connects the perceptual world to these other dimensions, if not spirit? And what, so what other realities are happening in, here in front of us besides the, the physical reality? There are no limits except those that are on existence itself. Whatever can exist, can exist in this theory. Most of us perceive three dimensions, is that, is that correct? That's in one dimension of time, so it's three plus one. And how many, per, do you perceive more than that? Can I perceive, can, can I see more than three spatial dimensions? Yeah. Only when I'm deeply asleep. And <laughs> what do you see? Well, you actually see connections and correlations. You see patterns, right, that are not necessarily separated into dimensions. Three dimensions, they have a special property, which is they're all independent of each other. That's what it means, they're orthogonal, they're perpendicular, right? Mathematically, that means that they're independent. The dimensions of reality are not all independent of each other. They get tangled up and tied up in certain ways. And those are the patterns that you can see that will inform you of spiritual reality. Do you ever exhaust yourself? All the time. I'm exhausted right now. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> Largely without sleep in the last three days. That gives me an idea. What if, uh, I don't remember who taught me, who told me this, but like, what if we just tried to laugh right now? I would find that very easy. All right, let's do it. <laughs> you look funny, you know? <laughs> and I know I do too. Do you ever, like having this mind that is so rich, so you have all these ideas and thoughts, I can't imagine there being that many people you meet, if anybody, that you can really connect with in all of these things you're thinking and feeling. Well, that's so, so wonderful about I mentioned earlier about people tracking me down out of nowhere. Occasionally we'll have lots of young men, mm -hmm. you know, actually show up on the door and say, hi, are you Chris Langan? And I said, well, yeah, who are you? And it, it, these people have come from all over the country and they end up on my doorstep. I don't even know how they find me because I live in the middle of nowhere, but there they are. And then they reveal to me what their thoughts are about what I wrote many years ago, and I realize, you know, this is completely simpatico. I mean, this, this, this person actually understands what I'm talking about, which is always great, right? Especially when you're talking about the kind of things that I talk about. So the people you admire have immense cognitive ability. There's not people you admire for other reasons. Like, there's people like, I don't know, Bob Dylan, Patti Smith, um, Vincent Van Gogh, who maybe, you know, like, that have other abilities. Like, or is cognitive ability really the main thing that that well, well, that's 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 cognitive ability. As far as artistry is concerned, of course, there's also that creativity, that je ne sais quoi, you know, mm -hmm. something that's very hard to put your finger on, but it's there too. And that 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 ability, that ability to originate that I was talking about with the very greatest minds, that's what creative people have, quintessentially. I mean, that's what they do. They can originate things that are brand new. And so, yes, uh, uh, if I neglected to mention artists, I'm sorry, <laughs> because they're very... I got a little important. defensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about, okay, so if I forced you to say who you admire that's actually living today, 
who would who would you say? I admire almost everybody. I'm capable of, for example, if, if I see some Missouri dirt farmer mm -hmm. who's out there and he comes up with a way, a clever way of fixing a machine or solving a problem that I haven't seen before, mm -hmm. I admire him. I'll tell him to his face, you're a genius. Yeah, have you, you know? met him before? Have I met him? Are you talking him? about a specific farmer? Oh yeah, I've met, I've met dozens of them, dozens of them. It's like I say, everybody has their own particular brand of intelligence, yeah. and I admire them for it. They're very admirable for it, especially when they can use it, when they can focus it. And most people are able to do that to some extent. So yeah, I admire, yeah, okay. I admire almost everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that Hawking is being over-optimistic in at least two ways. He's giving us 200 years, whereas we may already have passed the point of no return. We can hope that that's not the case, but we must redress the situation as soon as we possibly can. The other way in which he may be over-optimistic is that in order to get human beings off planet, we will have to build very big spaceships in orbit. And the current allocation of resources is such that we're spending our money on other more trivial things. And therefore, we'll never be able to get enough together to build these great orbiting colonies that we'd need in order to get off planet. Have we already destroyed ourselves? Well, I mean, you've got certain things that are, that are brewing, and we don't know how bad they've gotten yet. For example, Fukushima. I mean, this is something, you know, they were supposed to close the nuclear cycle years and years ago. We're not supposed to have all this hot stuff that we have to get rid of. And we're especially not supposed to put it on in fault zones right next to places that experienced tsunamis, right? And yet, this is what certain people itching to stick some more money in their pockets have done. And it's a travesty that we've done to the environment, all kinds of toxins that we've introduced, GMO crops. We don't know how uh, modified genes actually affect uh, other organisms in the long run. We don't know that you can... <laughs> Are you okay over there? No. <laughs> you just depressed me. <laughs> It's just basically a two-valued logical compliment, a complementarity thing, where on the one hand you know something and on the other hand you don't. Some things mystify you and some things don't. The reason that Homo sapiens evolved beyond any of the other species was due to the ability that we can all buy into collective fiction together, whether it's civilization or a government or nation or money or religion that these collective fictions we all buy into. But I don't know, I don't know if we all have, I don't know if all six and a half billion of us have bought into any one same fiction. That's exactly right.